Hey there, welcome to the Unlockable Podcast. Today we're talking about some of our unpopular gaming opinions, and I think that works out great because we're always looking for ways to interact with you guys, and everyone on the internet loves to argue, right? So please feel free to drop a comment and let us know how wrong we are, and maybe if you're lucky, we'll fight you back. Enjoy the episode, and don't forget to subscribe to Bird Dog Gaming. Welcome back, guys. This is episode 7 of the Unlockable Podcast. I'm your host, Christian, and joining me is Hannah. That's me. Hannah, what's up? What have you been up to? Um, well, I just got back from Texas. I was there for three weeks. Texas? We, you were yeah. here and you didn't even tell me? Yeah, well, pandemic, man. Pandemic. I know. We don't want to spread any germs. But yeah, I went up there with my family. We were moving my brother in since he just got a job in Dallas. So we moved him in, which was nice. Um, and then I visited my grandmother, who also lives there, and then my mom's side of the family. So both your parents have family in Texas? No, it's just my mom. Oh, okay. Well, you did some game hunting, too, didn't you? I did a little bit. Not a lot of stuff is open because, you know, pandemic. But uh, I went to a place called Movie Game... No, Movie... Oh, crap. Hold on. Oh, okay. It was called Movie Trading Company. So, at first, it doesn't seem like there's going to be video games there, but actually they have a whole lot. And they sell, like, new ones, too. Like, shrink-wrapped and everything. Um, and then I went to a lot of half price books, because that's, like, my favorite place to go. I don't know why. Um, and yeah, that was pretty much it. Nothing else was really open. Well, I know you got a really cool pickup, and I'm excited for everyone to hear about it in a minute. Um, so where was that moving trading movie trading company was it in dallas no it was in frisco Mm. frisco texas i do believe oh and you went to the museum right yeah oh yeah i forgot about that so yeah i i did go to the museum which was amazing by the way never have i ever set foot in a place that held so much value in video (laughs) games I was super annoying, I know, telling you to go there, but... Like, you need to go, you need to go. (laughs) That was amazing. Yeah, if you're ever in Texas, audience, if you're ever in Texas, this is a really cool... It's the National Video Game Museum, and they spell video game with one word, which is a sin, but it's a really (laughs) cool museum here in Frisco, Texas. Anyways, I have been pretty much chilling i have been uh i've been back to work but other than that you know working on youtube videos and playing some video games you've had no time for video games no i've been so super busy that i haven't even had time to pick up my switch at all and you're getting ready to travel again right i am me and my friends are going on a road trip all the way up to colorado oh driving through texas we are driving through texas again wow all right, talk to me about what you've been buying then since you haven't been playing anything. Okay, so while I was in Texas, I picked up Ribbit King on the GameCube. What? Yeah, that is the first time I've ever seen that game in the wild. Ever. And actually, while I was there, I saw a second copy of the game. But yeah, I bought I bought Ribbit King, and now I'm a proud o- owner of a uh, super, well, I don't know if it's super rare, but a rarer GameCube title. You gotta Very tell exciting. us what you paid for it. So, well, for me, it was free, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, I paid $40 for it. 40 so, bucks, and what does it go for? Over $100? Something like that, yeah. I'm hoping the price will just keep soaring, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 40 bucks, kind of a bargain, if I do say so myself. And then I also picked up Neo Atlas 1469, which I know nobody knows what that is, but it's a Nis America or Nice America, and I asked America, <laughs> and those games kind of go up in price if you don't get them right away. So it was, I think it was like seven dollars or something crazy. So seven dollars for a Switch game is a great deal, anyways. But yeah, I bought it for the Switch at a GameStop actually, um, and then the next one I actually got from a furniture store. <laughs> oh, I remember this. <laughs> so I was in, I was in Texas and removed my brother in, so we needed to find furniture and stuff. So we went to Nebraska Furniture Mart. Which, I don't know if you've ever been to one of those, because I, I, 
I think they're only in either Texas or Nebraska, but they're humongous. It was two stories. Like, I know you know what an Ikea is, right? Right. It was like that, but they sold lawnmowers and kitchen appliances and video games and toys, and it was insane. It was huge. It was two stories, and it had its own parking garage and everything. Anyway, so so while I was there, I got uh, Aragami Shadow Edition, which is for the Switch. It was $15. Figured it was a pretty good deal. And then while I was at the movie trading company, I also got the Princess Peach, Diddy Kong, and the Villager Super Smash Brothers Amiibo for their retail price. They were open, so I guess that, I don't know, dwindles the price anyway, but I opened them anyway, so it doesn't matter. But yeah, for retail price, and then the last thing I got was the Spyro uh, Kotaku figure, which is the first non-Nintendo figure I've ever bought. Well, congratulations. Thank you. So you went to Texas to buy a video game at a place called the Nebraska Furniture Store. I yes. I I'm not the only <laughs> one who hears the irony. Yes, I did. <laughs> well, I have had time to play video games. I have started playing Ori in the Blind Forest. Did you play that one? I know it's on Switch. I did not. Really just a gorgeous... It's a Metroidvania. I, I thought it was a 2D platformer until I started playing it. It's a really gorgeous uh, Metroidvania. And it was an Xbox exclusive. I don't know where or why it became available on the Switch. But, yeah, it is. Uh, I got Doom Eternal. I don't know if I talked about it on the last episode. But I beat that game. Absolutely love that game. Uh, it's just as good, if not better, than Doom 2016. Highly recommend that. And currently, I'm playing Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door and A Link Between Worlds. And I know I've talked about it before. I've never beat The Thousand Year Door. Um, Even now, I thought I owned it, but I'm apparently borrowing it from a friend. So that kind of sucks. Oh, (laughs) Um, man. (laughs) Isn't that the worst? Um, So I'm like almost done with that game. And I'm almost done with A Link Between Worlds. So I'm kind of like crossing off two games that... I feel like I have to play. You know, those are some pretty big name games there. Especially uh, yeah, the they are. Door. <laughs> You're late to the party, my friend. I'm not going to beat it before, what is today, Wednesday. So in two days, Paper Mario's coming out. I'm not going to have it beaten by then, but I'm not planning to pick up Origami King just yet anyway. Did what? you pre-order it? Well, no, but... <laughs> So I have, okay, so I have an internal conflict, right? So everybody likes free stuff, right? Well, GameStop is the only retailer that's actually getting, like, a pre-order bonus, which is just two little pins. Um, But, yeah, so none of my stores in Florida, none of the uh, GameStop stores are open here. So it's either um, contactless delivery or whatever they're calling that or delivery and some stores aren't even doing the contact delivery, so I'd have to drive like an hour away to do that. Anyways, so it's an extra $10 if I want the game on release day. Otherwise, it comes like a week later. What kind of crap is that? Wow. Yeah, Amazon is like way better for that stuff and Best Buy. Yeah, so I in I could probably get the pins for like $15 or whatever on... Um, Amazon, or not Amazon, but uh, eBay or whatever afterwards. But, like, we all know Walmart's going to have the game for $50. Right. So why don't I just do that and then spend $15 on the pins if I really want them. It'll still be cheaper. You know, as far as pre-order bonuses go, they're like... I feel like everyone gets the pre-order bonuses these days, but because this one's coming out during quarantine and apparently some GameStops aren't even open, I don't know, those might be uncommon someday who knows speculation that's true maybe it's possible god knows we're not going to use the pins just gonna put them on the shelf oh well speak for yourself oh for real (laughs) yeah you've never seen my jean jacket with all my pins on it no yeah i have a jean jacket where i put all my pins and stuff that i collect and it weighs like 75 pounds it's really heavy (laughs) jean jackets are heavy anyways but when you put a bunch of metal on them it makes it increasingly heavy not that I ever wear that here because I'd get a heat stroke, but it's a cool novelty thing. Other than that, I'm playing the. I'm regularly playing Rocket League and Animal Crossing, the usual. 
<sighs> I got a couple people to freaking buy that game, and they've been playing it with me a little bit. But uh, those poor, poor souls. I've been buying a lot of freaking games off of eBay. I have been, I've been on eBay more than I've been on like Twitter and Instagram. I'm gonna be honest with you. Please tell us your finds. I'm not going to tell you my finds, but I got a <laughs> lot of Game Boy Advance games complete in box. I got a lot of box and manuals that I've been needing for my loose games. Um, Rayman Arena for PS2 and Xbox. And I actually got Rayman Arena in a little lot of three PS2 games. So like, I bought it for Rayman Arena, but it came with Superman like Rise of Apocalypse or something, and then Pac-Man World 2, which were two Black Label PS2 games I didn't have, so that was cool. Really cheap bundle there. And then... I kind of overpaid for a box manual and inserts for the original Pokemon Gold on the Game Boy Color, but nothing I can do about it now. I'm happy to have it in the collection. It looks nice on the shelf. It just came in today, actually. Ooh... And uh, the good people on Instagram, Corey, Sally, and uh, Gamers and More, they post these deals all the time. And I don't buy a whole lot of modern stuff. Like, I, I, I don't know. I don't buy a ridiculous amount of Switch games like I do retro games. But they had this Doom Eternal Steelbook for 5 bucks at Best Buy. And I already had the game. So for 5 bucks, just to get the Steelbook was way too good to pass up. That's cool. Very cool. They had like Shenmue 3 and something else as well, Resident Evil, I think. I don't know why Best Buy just sells the Steelbook, but I'm happy about it. It worked out good for me. And I have a little story. I tried to buy, I don't know if you've ever seen it. It is the collector's edition of Robotech Battle Cry, and it's on PS2, Xbox, original Xbox, and the GameCube. I tried to buy the GameCube version, right? Uh this guy had it listed for like five dollars it was just the starting bid and it was pretty new listing um i didn't check this guy's <laughs> this guy's um reviews he had zero reviews and obviously he had zero positive reviews so um right i didn't learn that until after the fact but i made him an offer for a hundred dollars which is amazing an amazing deal for this thing and he actually said yes and he accepted my offer and I was like, whoa. And then, you know, after I purchased it, I'm looking at his no reviews. And I'm like, oh, crap. Am I going to get screwed? Uh, luckily, well, let me not skip ahead. He messages me out of, like, nowhere and says, hey, I need to switch to, um, I need to relist this for on my other eBay account because eBay is not giving me my funds. And I was like, well, what? And at this point, I'd already paid. I used PayPal. Um, and <laughs> he was being really sketchy and his English was really bad. Like, not like he spoke a different language, but like he was like trying not to, I don't know. He had like a lot of typos is what I'm trying to say. Um, but end of the day, I took my money back from PayPal because he was being too sketchy and I didn't get my item. So... Oh no. And then I saw the item relisted on a different eBay account, and I reported it, and that was about all I could do, and it's still there. I think people are bidding a couple hundred dollars on it right now. <laughs> God, that sucks. Why do people do that? I tried to post it on my Instagram story, too, so hopefully I saved one or two people from wasting their time. But yeah, that's it for me buying and playing, so... um why don't we get started with some news? You can go first. All right. I will go first. This one is kind of uh, a long list, so stick with me. It's the limited run uh, E3 or in lieu of E3 presentation. And if you don't know, limited run is the company that makes PS4, Vita, Switch games, indie games, physical. And if so, you also don't know about E3, it was not happening because of COVID. Right. I think that's obvious pretty yeah <laughs> okay so here here's the list uh and if i pronounce any of these wrong i'm sorry so first is a boy and his blob for the ps4 then second is bloodstained curse of the moon 2 for switch and ps4 
Then the game that we talked about that was really similar to Paper Mario, which is Bug Fables, The Everlasting Sapling. That's getting a physical. Heck yeah, it's coming to the Switch and the PS4. That game has been getting a bunch of coverage. It's going to be a big deal. Yeah, it is. Um, and then the next one is Carrion or Carry On. I don't know how you pronounce that. And it's coming for the Switch. Um, next one is Castlevania Anniversary Collection coming to the PS4 and the Switch. Then Demon Turf for the Switch. And then Garo, Mark of the Wolves for PS4. And then Grandia HD Collection for the Switch. I definitely, most certainly might pick that one up. Um, and then there's Gris or Gris. Gris? <laughs> I think it's Gris coming to the Switch. Um, and then uh, Katana Zero coming to the Switch. Kunai coming to the Switch. And then Mega Dimension Neptunia. Seven. Seven. Coming to the Switch. Uh, Mighty Gunvolt Burst for the Switch and the PS4. My friend Pedro, which had a physical for the Switch, but it's now coming to the PS4. Um, Observer for the Switch. Papers, please, coming to the Vita. I don't know why they're doing that. Does anyone really <laughs> buy Vita games anymore? Oh my gosh, I follow so many people that are just diehard Vita fans. Really? Yeah, I have no doubt that people are still buying those games. Oh, well, alrighty then. Good for all the Vita fans. And then next is Pixel Junk Eden 2. Coming to the Switch, Return of Abra Din for the Switch and PS4. And then there's been a promise that there's going to be more River City Girls. Uh, doesn't say console, but moving on. Samurai Jack. Heck yeah. Battle Through Time. Switch and PS4. That one looks pretty fun. It looks like a little cool hack and slash. I freaking loved Samurai Jack when I was a kid. Absolutely yeah. loved it. Um, next one is Shantae coming to Switch and Game Boy Color. What? What? Yeah, you read that right. I'm pretty sure this is from <laughs> the official limited run website, so hopefully that's right. Um, anyway, next is Shantae Risky's Revenge coming to the Switch. Then Space Channel 5 VR, kind of funky news flash, which is coming to the <laughs> PlayStation Virtual Reality. Um, then Star Wars Episode One Racer, Switch, PS4, and PC. Super Meat Boy Forever, Switch, PS4. The Friends of Ringo Ishikawa, uh, coming to Switch. The Mummy Demastered, coming to Switch and PS4. Uh, and then The Secret of Monkey Island 30th Anniversary Anthology. Wow, what a mouthful. Coming to PC. What is it uh, with those games? Are those like point-and-click adventures? Yeah, they are. I don't know uh, why people like them so much. I mean, I have I haven't played one, so I guess I I wouldn't know. But it doesn't seem like something that would be super interesting to me. Huh. Um, next is to the moon for the Switch, Towerfall Ascension for the Switch, Trover saves the world. No, sorry, Trover saves the universe, which I am <laughs> very excited for. That's the game that was made by Adult Swim Games and the creator of Rick and Morty, Justin Roiland. Gotcha. So that one seems. Super fun. I've always wanted to play that one, but I wasn't going to get it until it comes physical, and there we go. Uh, next is Where the Water Tastes Like Wine for the Switch and Extreme Sports for the Switch and Game Boy Color, again. What? And then the last about one. That. Yeah. Is it a way forward game as well? Um. I'm going to look it up. Go ahead and talk about the last one. Yeah, you might want to. Okay, and so the last one is Yeast Origin. So my freaking wants from the last podcast are actually making it, which is amazing. Oh, and also while we're, while we're gosh dang it, while we're on that topic, um, Yeast Nine, I think, yeah, Monstrum Knox has been announced for the Switch, also Ooh. coming in 2021. So how freaking exciting! Is that game not out yet? It is in Japan, but oh, they okay. just they just announced it for the Western audience. So how okay. exciting! Um, I looked up Extreme Sports. It is a way forward game. I've never heard of it. You know, like Shantae is like a huge deal, probably because it was like super expensive or whatever. But mm -hmm. so like the Game Boy Color set collectors out there, are y'all gonna have like not full sets if you don't buy these limited run games? That's an Ooh. interesting thing to talk about. Yeah, it I is. I don't think there are many people with a Game Boy Color set, though. Especially not complete in box. Probably not. Um. Okay, The Mummy Demastered. I think we talked about it on like, the first, maybe the second episode ever. And 
I'm a big fan of it. It's really good Metroidvania, also from Way Forward, so I recommend that one, and I might actually pick that one up physically. Ooh. So you listed like right. 50 games. How many are you buying? Oh, let's see. Definitely Bug Fables. I think I might get Grandia HD Collection just because I'm an, you know, RPG fan. Um, definitely going to get Trover Saves the Universe. And obviously I've already pre-ordered the collector's edition of Yeast Origin. <laughs> That's so really think... cool. I'm like literally happy for you because I know you've been wanting to play those. I have. I'm very excited. Um, okay, and also related to those games. So this is an interesting fact. You know how we were just talking about, like, set collection? You knew how people are, like, die hard, have to get all the limited run games? Right. Well, some of these games on the list, including Yeast Origin, are not made by limited run, but are being distributed by them on behalf of the game's original publisher. So that means that you don't have to buy these games um, in order to, like, complete your set. So it's oh not gosh. counted is one of the numbered releases. Wow. Yep. So it's probably going to... So say it again, it's... They're distributed so, by them, but they're published on behalf of the original publisher. Right. So the publisher was like... I guess huh. I guess an example I can give you is Yeast Origin. Obviously, the publisher is you know, from Japan, so they might not have the funds to bring it over or, like, the means to do so to bring it over to the Western audience. So Limited Run does that for them. That's pretty cool. I don't know how I feel about Limited Run to say, like, a positive or negative thing about them, but that's a pretty cool thing. It's cool for me because now I get to play all the freaking right, news games, right. man. So, yeah, that's really interesting. I guess that's good for all of the uh, Limited Run, I don't know, set Genetics. collectors, whatever you want to call that. <laughs> By the time this podcast is up, Paper Mario, the Origami King, should be out. And the reviews are looking pretty decent. There's a lot of 8 out of 10s, and I saw some 9 out of 10s, but then I also saw some 7 out of 10s, which I it's definitely not going to scare me away from buying it. It's still a day one purchase for me because I love that series, but I would have liked to see it been reviewed and rated higher. I don't know yeah, how you, you know, feel. I mean, as far as like the last couple of Paper Marios, I'm pretty sure their ratings were a lot lower so that's that's got to be a good sign of hope for all the paper mario fans out there um you know I, I held a poll this week on my instagram story asking if it was a day one pickup and it was literally 50 50 like some people said heck yeah i'm getting this on friday and some people said no way so i don't know really i wonder how much the reviews had to do with that right i wonder if uh you know a lot of people are like thousand year door diehards and they just they're purists and they don't want to play anything else so i don't know i'm sure they're gonna have to see some some footage some long plays some let's plays before they pick it up so i don't know we'll see yep you're probably right okay and then also on the same day of september nope sorry what <laughs> are we in july 17th <laughs> so the same day on july 17th ghost of shishima is also uh, releasing and I saw that those reviews were pretty decent as well, seven eights and nines depending on the reviewer. I don't have a PS4, so I won't be playing that, but that's cool for those people. Um, okay, so next, Sony invests two hundred and fifty million dollars in Epic Games, uh, but it says it will not affect Epic Games on other consoles. So don't you worry, Fortnite will still be on the Switch. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next is The World Ends With You, which is a game that originally released on the DS, and then, I don't know if it was considered a remake or a remaster, but it was brought over to the Switch, so that's getting an anime. That's kind of cool. I think that's a Square Enix uh, property. Yeah, it is. And next, there are so many leaked photos of Super Mario Land at Universal. There's coins spinning around, there's big blocks and mountains, and I guess quarantine was kind of a good thing for them so they could just build it without anyone really being out but yeah there's a lot of leaked pictures That's and i'm very florida, excited right? so yeah it's in florida and california i believe and obviously in japan so right. i will definitely be going pandemic or not and then more games were announced for the nintendo switch online and now they're actually out so it was donkey kong country which is one of my favorite childhood games of all time the natsume championship wrestling and the immortal you know it didn't hit me until just now but 
they've been putting out a lot of Natsume games. Maybe not a lot, but that's not the first time that they put out a Natsume game on the uh, Switch Online. No, it's not. But who's excited about wrestling? <laughs> At least one person listening to this podcast, I assure you. You're right. This is for you, dude. <laughs> Okay, and super fun update for all you Animal Crossing fans. You could now dive and swim. Woo. I'm sure you already know that if you play the game, but <laughs> for everyone who doesn't like me, <laughs> you can dive and swim. Nintendo Switches and Ring Fit Adventure are constantly coming and going in and out of stock. So they're constantly selling out and then being restocked. And then selling out and then being ring stocked. So if you're looking for one, good luck. Yeah, it seems like they're in stock a lot more. I would say try not to spend more than three hundred dollars on a brand new Switch. Yeah, don't definitely don't pay eBay scalpers. Don't mm-hmm. support that. Um, and then the NES and Lego crossover announced. So basically, you build a little NES console and an old TV, and it costs two hundred thirty dollars. How do you feel about that? How do I feel about it? I'm glad you asked, Hannah, because I made an entire Twitter thread about how I feel about it. Um, You could literally buy an entire NES complete in box for $200 or like less than $230, okay? That is absolutely absurd. And you get a CRT on the side of the road for free, so that's ridiculous. Carry on. All right. Well, I think it's freaking cool. Don't let my tone tell you otherwise. But I think it's cool. If If it was 10 years ago... And I was a 12-year-old girl. I, one, loved Legos and obviously loved anything Nintendo. So I definitely would have convinced my parents to pay for this. No doubt. I think it's cool, especially when you're in quarantine you have nothing better to do. I feel like building Lego sets, it's just something fun. And I know it's going to take you a long time. So it'll Legos be entertainment. Are cool. Legos are super cool. And this particular package is super cool. Like I, I don't like the price, but it's super cool. Yeah, I think it is a little expensive. But it's still really neat. Um, And then there is a rumored Nintendo Direct for July 20th. So hopefully we'll get a Direct by the time this podcast is out. It's looking more and more promising. Hopefully we we get some Breath of the Wild 2 news and some Metroid 4 updates and Pikmin 4 for you Pikmin fans. But probably not. (laughs) You know Nintendo. Nobody can predict them. And then Dragon's Dogma anime coming to Netflix on September 17th. Any idea what that is? No, I have, I know nothing about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I know it's a video game. It's an anime that's going to be based on the video game. So that's kind of cool. It's kind of like a Witcher deal. But it's oh, animated. Yeah. Um, and then Super Smash Bros. Ultimate DLC Fighters Joker and Hero Amiibo will release on October 2nd. I already have mine pre-ordered, and I am super excited. Very cool. If you guys haven't seen Hannah's uh, wall of Amiibo, it's it's at Game Girl Advance SP. It's the coolest thing ever. All right, my turn. I have, like, six bullet points. Here we go. All right, so I just saw this one yesterday, and it's hilarious. 64-player Super Bomberman R coming to Google Stadia. All right. A few years ago, Konami released Super Bomberman R for Xbox One, PS4, and Switch for Bomberman's 33rd anniversary. I've never heard someone celebrate the 33rd anniversary, but whatever. <laughs> Konami's a strange company. <laughs> um, wow. So this, I feel like, is a step in the right direction. Like, so close to being a step in the right direction. Until you read that it's coming to Google Stadia, and you're like, wow, where, where? thanks. <laughs> I don't... Whatever. If I had a Stadia, I'd probably be hyped for this, but I don't have a Stadia because I'm normal, and um, 64 players... (laughs) I feel like that's going to be super hectic. It's going to be like... Like, literally last episode or the episode before, we were talking about Saturn Bomberman, which is like 10 or 12 players, which is something I would love to experience. 64? That's probably freaking awesome. It's probably going to feel like uh, Tetris 99. Kind of. Tetris 99 is a blast. Oh, I freaking love Tetris 99. I didn't know you played that game. Uh, Not religiously, but I do like me some Tetris. Yeah. What else we got here? Sealed Super Mario Brothers on the NES sets the record for most expensive game sold to date. So, 
Um, if you're not a collector, you're going to hear this $114,000 and think that it's really stupid. But, you know, Mario is like the Superman of comic books. You know, he's like the, the guy. And um, it's a very special test market copy. So don't go in your attic looking for like a sealed copy that you might have had when you were a kid. It's not that kind of... It's not your typical Mario Brothers. Like, there's a lot of different print runs of that game. Um, this is a special test market copy. It's got a hang tab on it, and it's sealed. This particular one was graded by WADA Games for a 9.4, and it was sold on Heritage Auctions, which is, like, a company Go Collect owns them, I think. I'm pretty sure. Maybe they just work with them. Um, but they're, like, on top of graded comics and graded video games and graded stuff and they're selling it um it's like the high-end ebay <laughs> nice Heritage they're options. rich people ebay right right and in terms of ps5 we could see the price coming soon for that bad boy i'm still betting on it being 600 dollars. but you know what i shouldn't have said that because we might have a price by the time this episode comes out oh well Comment below if I'm wrong. A thousand dollars. Sony patents. You think so? No, I, I mean it could be. <laughs> the fact, okay, it's scary that they haven't put it out yet. I don't know if they're just having like a, a fight with Xbox and like, yeah, you release it first. No, you release it first. But it's scary that they haven't. I think we talked about this. I'm not sure, but yeah, I, I'm pretty sure it's just a chicken contest right now and. Sony's just waiting because they know their console is going to be more expensive than Xbox. That's my personal take on what's been happening. Because one of the Sony execs said it's they they had value in mind, not price. And that's just like Ouch. an easy way to say, like, this thing's going to cost a lot. <laughs> but people are like, oh, you know, I buy an expensive phone every, every two years, so what's the difference? Like, you know, I spent $1,000 on my iPhone. I'm just like... I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that argument yet. Sony patents PS1, PS2, and PS3 emulation via cloud streaming. Now, I heard originally that we were going to have full backwards compatibility. Maybe maybe I'm making that up, but I really thought that Sony was going to go for complete backwards compatibility on the PS5, and it's not looking like it anymore. We want a... We want to be able to stick a Crash Bandicoot disc directly into the PS5, and I don't think that that's going to happen. That kind of sucks. That's just not the type of backwards compatibility that everyone's hoping for. I, I read something that it could be on PS Now, which I'm not even sure what that is. I think it's like an online streaming service, kind of like Xbox Game Pass. I don't know. Psst, don't ask me. <laughs> and also coming this fall, the Atari VCS which I don't think we've talked about on the podcast at all, but Atari is releasing a new console, and for the longest time, for like four years now, it's just been like a myth. No one's actually seen any evidence of it releasing, but they've been active on Twitter lately, and now it looks like they're releasing it this fall. You can t They're taking pre-orders, and uh, listen to this. It is $280 for just the console, or, and that... By by just the console, I mean there is no controller included. What? Why? <laughs> so three hundred and ninety dollars gets you the console, the regular controller, which looks like an Xbox controller, and then a joystick controller. And both of these controllers are wireless, so don't worry about that. But um, definitely worry about the three hundred ninety dollars. So like, I don't want to see companies fail, but. It seems like Atari wants to see Atari fail because why would you release your your console to compete with the PS5 and the Xbox Series X? Like, they need to push this thing back at least four or five months. It's, it's crazy to me. Uh, there's a lot of questions there. Um, but could you imagine if they decided to come out with freaking wired controllers at $390? <laughs> at least it's not that right <laughs> i don't know i've seen some pictures of people playing fortnite on it who but... fortnite <laughs> i don't know how i feel about this thing i'm i, I think it's going to be a big flop it's going to be like the the nail in the coffin for atari i feel like but we'll see that's sad 
And the last thing for me, Capcom says that their game sales are 80% digital and rising. And they said that they want to get it up to 90%. So obviously companies make more profit when they sell digitally um, because they don't have to worry about manufacturing costs and everything like that. But it's sad. And we're definitely going to have to have an entire episode about the death of digital media, uh, physical media. But it's sad, you know. We're literally, we're collectors, so it, it really impacts us. <laughs> yeah, it does. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started with the topic of this episode. We are, what, like a half hour into this? Wow. Yes, we are. This was actually your idea, Hannah. Where did this come from? Did you have a bad experience on social media recently? <laughs> uh, no, but I do like to ask questions like this frequently on my Instagram. I just like to see what people's opinions are. Uh, and I thought, well, this will be a good topic, so why not do that? Because believe me, I have a lot of opinions. All right, so we're going to throw down this episode. Why don't you get started? Okay, so first of all, let me just preface and say that my opinions aren't necessarily based in fact, right? They're just feelings. Like, I think yellow is the ugliest color. Why do I think that? I, I just, I don't know. I just do. You know, so it's kind of like one of those things. All right. So my first one is, and this can be, I guess this is a blanket thing, but I, I uh, am going to apply it to video games. It's tradition is the death of progress and creativity. Never trying new things with the series gets old. Wow. There's a philosopher on the podcast. <laughs> yeah. So starting <laughs> off strong here. Um, and I think a prime example of this is Pokemon. Like essentially Pokemon is just the same freaking game with different Pokemon. And I think that's fine for people that like that. But for me, I quickly fell out of the series. Like, I played Silver, and I played Crystal, and I played Gold, and I played Emerald, and then after that, I was like, it's just the same thing. You know? Didn't you play Sword and Shield? I played Sword and Shield. That was, like, the first game. That was the first Pokemon I'd, ga I'd played in, like, ten years. Um, but that's probably just because I'm a Switch fanatic and Pokemon, yay. But uh, I, I did enjoy it, and I think they're moving in the right direction. But for so many years, it just felt so stale, and it was the same thing over and over again. I get that. I'm not going to try to argue with that one. Okay, so a branch off, I guess, unpopular opinion would be for me is I think Kirby Air Ride is the best Kirby game, and anyone can fight me on that one. Have you played Kirby games? I played Star Allies, I played Dreamland, I played Crystal Shards, I think that's what it's called. N64. And yeah, and one other one. But it's bad that I can't remember the title. I definitely should have researched that. But yeah, I played all of those and honestly none of those were as fun as freaking Kirby Air Ride. Is this a nostalgia thing? Do you have your nostalgia blinders on? No, I do not. This this is a game that me and well actually my friend introduced me to the GameCube. She bought me a GameCube from Goodwill and she's like, You need to play this game, it's amazing. <laughs> so I went over to her house and I played it, never having played any other GameCube games ever. And I was sixteen at the time, so six years ago. And it freaking blew me away. So no, it's not nostalgic. <laughs> but I just think it's a good freaking game. I've never had more fun with a Kirby game in my entire life. So if you don't know, Kirby Air Ride is obviously, I guess you consider it like a spin-off title or whatever. It's kind of like, you know, what Pokemon does with the, whatever, the dungeons or the Pokemon Quest or the whatever. It's like a spin-off title. You know, Pokemon um, Racing. Classic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They could totally do that, by the way. Anyway, so it's like a, there's three different modes. So there's racing on like a small scale, like a tabletop, and then there's actual racing like racing courses and then there's this one it's called city trial which is my favorite mode and basically you just you just ride around a city city trial and you collect power-ups so there's like flight and defense and um speed and all this other stuff and health and you just you just run around where i guess i guess you ride around on your car but there's different star cars and you can get pieces to create like the big fast star car and it's just a lot of fun and then after that you use those items or, or skills that you picked up in like mini games after and so there's a bunch there's a huge checklist of like 200 things that you can do and it's just fun and you just run around and you collect stuff which is like my life i collect video games i like collecting stuff 
you know it's been it's been a few years since i tried that one i don't even own it but i had uh i had borrowed it at one point and i was just not a fan of it but okay you sure next do time, make it sound like a blast next time i come to texas we are playing that because i kid you not it is one of the funnest games i've ever played in my life it's gonna have to be after uh, shrek's big party or whatever Super party, man. Super party. <laughs> you get that wrong all the time. Super party. That one's fun, too. Fight me. Um, But, yeah, it kind of relates to traditions because it was a really one-off Kirby game. And not a lot of, you know, traditional Kirby supposed to be a platformer. Meh. People are going to like that because it was so different. But I freaking love it. You're allowed to have an opinion. I'll allow it. Okay, thank you. I'm glad you allow that. And so my next one kind of falls under the same thing. I thought Paper Mario Color Splash was a good game, despite what all the Thousand Year Doors uh, fanboys say. You know, if you didn't put this on your list, I would have totally agreed. Um, did you play Sticker Star? I did not play Sticker Star, so I, I don't have an opinion on that. But it, it's fun. It might not be a traditional Paper Mario game, but it has some of the same elements, and I think what they tried to do is incorporate the Wii U gamepad, which did not bother me at all. I thought that was fun. I thought it was cool. I actually got to use... Actually, because, yeah, because when you went into battle, you had the cards, and you had to fill the cards up and then flick it to the screen. I thought that was freaking cool. Yeah, there was a lot of times where I thought the Wii U gamepad was a little underused, and I feel like that was just kind of... I don't know. It wasn't necessary, but I guess it was cool that it was in there. I thought it was cool. And actually... You could play that game, like, away from the TV. So, like, obviously this is before the Switch came out. So I used to have the game on my TV up here. And I could go downstairs and watch TV and play the game at the same time. So it was like a pre-Switch switch. That was, like, that was how they advertised it back in, like, 2012. I remember, like dad came home and the kid was playing wii u and the, the dad turned on baseball or whatever and he just kept playing mario on his gamepad i remember that so it was like the switch before the switch and i think i still think the humor in that game is funny like no spoiler alerts but like you fight a piece of steak is that I not funny that. <laughs> is that not funny yeah i, I thought it was, it was fun. a good game i had fun with sticker star i think i played sticker star before that um both solid games in my opinion but I'm sure we'll get some comments about those. I'm sure. Please let us know in the comments if you're a uh, Thousand Year Door fanboy. Please. You guys have the best opinions. <clears throat> okay. And so this one is kind of another branch off of that. But uh, it's game reviews, to me, are stupid. Like, I know that's what people base a lot of like their purchases off of. But Color Splash was rated not very well, but I thought it was freaking fun. So, I think game reviews are too subjective, and they have to, like, compare, they, okay, they don't have to, but most reviewers compare those games to previous ones in the series, right? So, was it more fun, or did it have more mechanics, or stuff like that? But, I don't think that's a fair way to review games. Like, um, especially what I was saying about traditions, if you add something to a game that wasn't in the one before it, and it's bad, they'll say, oh, that's stupid, it variated from tradition, that's bad. But at least they're trying something different, you know? Yeah, I guess that's a fair statement. Um, Yeah. All right, here's one that I feel like is really unpopular. Uh, The world does not need more HD remasters. We don't need every game that ever came out, every game that people are nostalgic for, we don't need it to be remade just because graphics are better. I know that if you listen to this podcast, you know that I've talked about a Rayman trilogy remaster, whatever. Honestly, if it came out, I'd buy it. But that's just because I'm a freaking weirdo that loves Rayman. But I I don't need it. Um, and like if that happened, it would show me that Ubisoft cares about Rayman still. So I don't know. That's that's kind of like in its own boat. But in general, I don't need twenty to thirty year old games getting remasters that are like commonly available and like people are i'm pretty sure any day now we're gonna get mario sunshine or some kind of mario compilation like um remaster and i don't need that (laughs) i literally when every wii u game was ported to the switch in 2017 2018 like i i didn't buy any of them unless i didn't have it previously um like i have pokemon tournament because i didn't own it on the wii u but that's about it 
it's just not necessary. I think that we aren't seeing enough new games come out. And, like, I don't know. If there are extra people sitting around doing nothing at Nintendo's office, then sure. Let them make an entire Mario pack and release it on the Switch. That's cool. But, like, so many people... I, I know not everyone's a collector, but there are a ton of people that have Mario 64 still. Mario Sunshine still. Like, they're not hard to find games they're mario so they sold millions and millions and they're everywhere everybody's got mario in their attic or whatever i don't know what do you think all right well there's a lot of one pack there but i totally disagree with you <laughs> like like 100 percent. so i think hd remasters are amazing um especially and we talked about this on our last podcast especially if the original games are like super expensive and not a lot of people own them like, right. imagine a remastered game with updated graphics on a new console that you have, and it's only 60 bucks versus who knows how much. Like, if it's a GameCube game, like, I don't know, freaking $1,000. So, I think it would be cool to own that on a modern system. And, plus, an, like, another example of that would be Final Fantasy Remake. Like, a lot of those games were limited based on what the technology allowed. So, now we're getting bigger games, better games, better graphics, better frame rates, all of that. So, you can really... Like, reimagine what the game was initially intended to be. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. And that's, I, I intentionally didn't say remake, or I don't think I did. I, I tried to say only remaster for this conversation because I do think what they did with Final Fantasy VII and Trials of Mana, I think that's super cool. Um, and I'm all for that, to be honest with you. I don't, I'm just talking about remasters here, but go ahead. Um, so yeah, if it was super expensive, then I don't know, I'd rather pay 60 bucks for it than, you know, whatever, how much, but, uh, no, I liked it. And you, and you touched on, uh, not liking that the Wii U games came over. I didn't mind that at all, either. Like, they weren't for you if you already owned them on the Wii U. They're for people that, one, didn't buy Wii U because it was a dying system anyways, but two is to give, you know, the game another chance. Like, could you imagine being the developer of that game and you see it sell like five copies on the Wii U and you're like, wow, <laughs> this game must have really sucked. I put my, you know, sweat, blood and tears into this game and nobody bought it. And then you put it to the Switch and all of a sudden a bunch of people buy it. You know, a perfect example of that is, I know I'm like going against what I just said, but uh, the wonderful 101, that game sold out instantly whenever it was listed and they, I don't think anybody bought it on Wii U. Yeah. That's true. And then and then uh, I have another point for remasters. I think, for me personally, I don't own a lot of those games. And even if I did, it's not, like, the best way to play it. But if it came to the Switch, then you can also play it handheld, you know? So a Switch, to me, plays a, b- a big deal and stuff like that. I see a lot of people say stuff like that, and it's just like, I guess I'm not a big handheld gamer. But a lot of people seem to like being able to take these games like... Uh, Oh, that big, huge Skyrim. Everybody was so pumped when Skyrim. They were like, yes, I can play it on the go. I was like, was that a big deal in the first place? Like, did, is it a problem that you couldn't just play it in front of your TV or computer? Uh, yeah. <laughs> especially someone, especially coming from someone who takes public transportation a lot. That's like the perfect time to do it, isn't it? The more you talk... Oh, you're talking about me? Ooh. Yeah. That's very true. Very true. I don't know. The more you talk, the more it seems like I'm going to get a lot of hate in the comments for, these, <laughs> for this opinion yeah. here. <laughs> and then, okay, I have another thing. I'm telling you, I love to argue. But another thing is, like I said about it being limited to based on the console, not all games come out and they're 100% perfect, you know? So if they get just an HD remaster and brought over, then they can, you know, perfect things. Like, oh, that was glitchy before. Or, like, especially if it's an old game and you can't, like, patch it. Like you can now, but like you can bring over older games that the story wasn't quite right, or this didn't make sense, or there's translation errors, or or whatever, an infinite number of things that could go wrong, and then you can perfect it. Especially for people like me who are nostalgic to so many freaking apparently bad games, you know, but they can always listen to the audience and say, we want this fixed, or we want this changed, and they can do it and re-release it. Or they could make a sequel to that series. No, that's stupid, because nobody's nostalgic towards that sequel or nostalgic towards the first one. It's stupid, because Streets of Rage 4 (laughs) was like a huge deal. A game came out 20, 30 years ago, and it had a huge following when it came out, and it was awesome. 
not I'm not stupid. saying in I'm not saying in all cases, but you know, they can always release an H D remaster, see how that sells. And if there's still people, diehard fans and they still buy it, then they can make a sequel. I don't have a problem with that. But if they release it and nobody want like a sequel and nobody wants it and it fails, then you'll never see that series again. I understand your opinion and I'm gonna let you uh I'm gonna let you walk away with it. <laughs> You can you can disagree with me and tell me that I'm wrong, but <laughs> I think a lot of people are of the same opinion. So that is certainly an unpopular opinion. You nailed it. Honestly, though, sequels to all these old games like we're seeing is, is something that I am a fan of. Um, and I think everybody's a fan of it. I'm not saying it's an unpopular opinion, but in relation to this topic, um, Streets of Rage 4 is a prime example. Shenmue 3, I don't care about Shenmue, but that was freaking awesome that that game got a sequel. Tons of examples, I'm sure. But yeah, go ahead with your next one. Okay, so my next one is... I don't know if people are going to necessarily agree with it, but I think linearity can be a good thing in games. Like, you know how games now are all open world? And like, oh, oh you can do this. Linearity. <laughs> you can do this in any world, and you can climb here and do that. Like, I freaking loved that in Breath of the Wild. But I also think that the game kind of suffered. You know, because the developers didn't know where you're going to go first. So they couldn't be like, okay, this is easier. And then this is harder. And then depending on where you go, it increases from there, you know? So I think if there's linearity in a game, like most of the traditional Zelda games, um, it's more tightly controlled, you know, because they know what path they're going to take. So they can make it either increasingly harder or, you know, I don't know, like make, I don't know, like make cutscenes specifically for that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like I Breath of the Wild. Mean. Didn't have that at all. Yeah, I mean, I I am all for linearity. In fact, I I can't stand open world games. <laughs> no, that's not true. I I have a hard time playing. So good example here. I've been trying to play Red Dead Two for like two years. I got that game in like 2018 or whatever. Um, still trying to beat that freaking game because it's just so long. And I feel like if it was linear, um, and I didn't have all these thousands of side quests to do, I probably would have beaten it by now. But I don't think I think it's just a personal thing for me. I like being told exactly where to go next. You know, um, another good example: a link between worlds. I was telling you the other day, it's like annoying when I don't know where to go. Yeah, uh, I don't like that. It's just not something I'm a big fan of. But it's not game breaking for me. I still like a link to the past and a link between worlds. They were both great games. But I get frustrated when I don't know where to go, and I I will eventually look it up if I can't figure it out. In some games, it's it's probably better to do an open world, like, non-linearity. But I think a game could definitely benefit from it, especially what you're saying is people get lost. People don't necessarily follow the same train of thought that the developers do, you know? Sometimes it's a stretch. It worked really well in Breath of the Wild, and I know Zelda's not the first game to do it, but you and I probably don't have a lot of experience with other open world sandbox games like that. Nope. I mean, I have Xbox One and PS4, but I just don't play... Like, I'm trying to think of a game that's like that. Probably Skyrim. Like, I don't... I've never played Skyrim, but I imagine it's probably just like that in the fact that it's super open world. Yeah. Um, or maybe I'm embarrassing myself right now. I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, you're not. But yeah, I think it's a good thing in some games. I think Breath of the Wild probably... I don't know. Do you, do you look at Breath of the Wild lesser because of it? No, absolutely not. I do not. I think okay. that... I don't know if you want me to get into this unpopular opinion that I agree with, but I think, I don't know if I can say that Breath of the Wild is the best Zelda game, but it's pretty high up there on my list. I still think for me, Ocarina of Time, which is like a super linear Zelda game, is probably the best, but it's definitely up there. Breath of the Wild is definitely up there for me, but I, the open worldness and the you know, it's hinging on the player, like, where the player wants to go. That didn't... I like that a lot. I hope they continue to do that going forward. Gotcha. And then you have to go into the discussion of, like, oh, is is Breath of the Wild even a Zelda game? You know? It's really oh, you not. Really, you really want to get... Oh, you really want to get me started on that one? Oh, is that one of your points? <laughs> no, it was not. That was one of those unpopular opinions that I disagree with. <laughs> you think it's a Zelda game? Yeah, absolutely. All right. I, I, well, first you have to, you ask what makes up a core Zelda game. And I think that's different for everybody. I think 
Some people say it has to be super linear. I don't think so. The first one wasn't linear. You can go wherever you want. It basically just dropped you in the middle of a freaking map, and then you find your way. You can do any of the dungeons in any order that you want, obviously, except for the last one. But if anything, it goes back to the original with the open worldness, you know? I don't know if you've ever played that one, but... No, but I know what you mean. I, I didn't know that you could do them in any order like that. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, you can't argue with that because that's literally the first game, so... And, that's, that's and, on that. top of that, people argue that the story, because it wasn't linear, the story was kind of all over the place, but the first games honestly didn't have any story. Like, Zelda 2, the story was all freaking in the manual, and if you didn't have the manual, then you didn't get a story, you just kind of played. Interesting. Mm hmm So, if anything, it goes back to the original Zelda. And those and the aspects. The story in that game was, uh... Oh my gosh, I'm gonna screw it up. Dang it. <laughs> you got this. It's dangerous out there. Take this. That's the only story in that game. Oh, it's dangerous to go alone. Take this. You're right. so close. <laughs> <laughs> so close. And then, I guess branching off of that is my next unpopular opinion is Skyward Sword is an amazing Zelda game and you can freaking fight me on that one. I can't, no, but the audience can. I love that game. First of all, it gives the origin of the Zelda series. So the reason why Zelda and Link and Ganondorf are all reincarnated almost every single game and why they're that way and how to break that and how Hylians became to be and how the royal family came to be and how could you not? Like, that is the best Zelda game in terms of story. And the visuals were beautiful. And I think... That the motion controls in that game were cool. I liked that you were like Link and you were swinging your sword around. Do I wish that they were a little more accurate? Absolutely. But I still think it was a cool idea and it utilized the Wii's motion controls. So I played Twilight Princess on the Wii. Um, that one used motion controls, but probably not in the sense that Skyward Sword did, right? Uh, I don't know. I didn't play Twilight Princess on the Wii. I played it on the GameCube. So, like, it, well, it doesn't matter where you swing or how you swing. It's going to do an automatic swing, but oh, no. it, it's not like that in Skyward Sword? No, if you swing to the left, the sword will go to the left. If you hold it up and swing it down, it'll go down. That game used the Wii Motion Plus, I remember. Yeah, it did. Yeah, I mean, that one's on my list of my very long backlog. I can't argue about that game yet, but... It had... Do people complain about the story or just the gameplay? No, just the gameplay, mostly, and a lot of people don't like that it's super linear and it makes you, like, backtrack through places, but every mm. time you backtrack through places, like, it opened up new areas in that places, so I didn't really get that same sense, and then a lot of people didn't like that you fight the same boss three times, like, over and over and over, you have to keep returning to the place, and every time you get stronger. I didn't necessarily mind that, um... I thought it was okay. I definitely would have seen, like to have seen some more variety, but if they make an HD remaster of it, they can fix that. That's one of those games that would definitely benefit from that. And I know I've talked about that over and over and over and over again, but that's still my opinion. And so on the same note, I think that gyro aiming is better than traditional analog stick aiming. It's more accurate. And obviously I'm not talking about the PC, like point and click, like obviously you can't get any more accurate than that. Right. But I think it's the most accurate way to play those first-person shooters. Because you can actually move it, and you can move it just a little bit. And honestly, the regular aiming with the freaking Like, Fortnite, like, if I tried to play it on the Xbox, I almost threw up. It's, like, so, so all over the place. Oh my gosh, you play with motion controls on the Switch? Yeah, dude! <laughs> We've talked about this, I forgot. You are every, a one in a million human being right there. No! Every game <laughs> that offers that, I use it. It's more no, accurate than the other stuff. Yes, I do! I play it with Splatoon and Mario Fortnite. Kart? Well, no, not Mario Kart. That's different. That's not a first-person shooter. Wow. But I do it... You know how... Um, well, actually, I don't know if that can happen on the Wii U, but in Breath of the Wild, you can actually like aim it when you're fighting enemies. Like with the, right, um, yeah, the, the, the bow and arrow. The bow and arrow. I do. I like it. I think it's way better. That is hilarious. I don't know a single soul that would admit on a podcast that they use motion controls on Fortnite. Why 
it's so much better. <laughs> and you can change the sensitivity. I, I just think it's more accurate. You know what? It's great. I bet one of your unpopular opinions on this freaking on this freaking episode is also uh, that Guitar Hero is better on the controller. So I don't even want to hear about it from you. <laughs> I like it that way too. We played it. You said it was great. You said, "Oh, Hannah, this is the best way to play this game." Why have I never oh, thought of that? Yeah. I remember. <laughs> Love me some Controller Hero. <laughs> exactly. Wow. Yeah. You can go now. I can go? Yeah. You have All right. permission a to couple go now. Good, uh, <laughs> there's a couple good segues I could go from here, but let's talk about Metroid. So I, in the past few years, I didn't really grow up with a lot of Metroid, but in the past few years, I've gotten through pretty much every game, um, 2D and 3D. 2D and 3D. So I'm, <laughs> I, I love the 2D. <laughs> it's my Texas twang there. Uh, <laughs> I love the 2D Metroids. I I like Metroid Prime, the Metroid Prime trilogy. But I want to talk about Metroid Other M today because I think it's a great game. So have you played it or not? Uh, no. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> that was Why'd a you silly have to question. Think about it? Uh, because I don't know dramatic effect no i have not i have not touched any metroid game well, this game is like a hybrid between 2d and 3d metroid and honestly the gameplay is fine everybody rips it to shreds on the internet like it's sonic 06 or something because of the story <laughs> and it's you know it's it's notorious for being shredded apart because of its story because samus gets treated like tossed around like she's a rag doll in the game like she's like ordered what to do and in every other game she's this bad mofo who's like you know a bounty hunter and she doesn't take orders from anybody but uh they make her look so weak in the game and you know what i don't (laughs) i have a reputation for not caring about the story so you know it worked out great for me this this (laughs) game (laughs) they had some really long cutscenes that you couldn't skip which i know people hated i didn't even I didn't really I, okay I'll watch the story maybe I just have bad memory or something but I don't even now playing Paper Mario the Thousand Year Door I have no idea why I'm opening this door like what is the purpose and I've been playing this game off and on for like the last couple months but uh <laughs> it's just like I don't why does it matter I'm, I'm I'm more into the gameplay and I know you're a big story person but I'm all for the gameplay um with that being said i really thought other m was a fantastic game um it's been years i haven't played it since it came out and on top of that it was my first metroid game so maybe i need to go back and play it again but i don't think there's a lot of complaints for the gameplay i think it's mostly just the story so unpopular opinion here metroid other m is a great game and you should check it out not you but you know you in general <laughs> I, I check <laughs> it you can out. check it out <laughs> Do you have it? Um, no. Uh, uh, no, I don't. The only That's Metroid like game I have respect. is the first one and the second one. Metroid Prime. Um, okay, but you said something, and I just want to argue with you because that's what we're doing here. But you said that I prefer story over gameplay. And it's not that I prefer it that way, but <laughs> if if there's a good story, I can get through the gameplay. You know, does that make sense? Yeah, because you've told me about it before and it's crazy to me. So what she's saying is that if a story is so good that she'll suffer through, I don't know, a genre like Fire Emblem that she doesn't even like because the story (laughs) is so good. Yes, exactly. (laughs) I just, I'm a sucker for story. If I get invested with the characters and the story is something that I've never thought of or if it like blows my mind. I'm like, I have to keep playing with this. I have to be an expert at this game. Because you have to be pretty good at freaking Fire Emblem to finish it. Because, I mean, those are, for me, those are pretty difficult. I'm not a tactical, strategical person. But I put in that many hours just so that I could finish the game. Because the story was so good, I had to figure out what happens. Honestly, I, I admire you for that. That's pretty cool that you can do that for the sake of story. I wish I cared about it as much as you do, but I just don't. I am a sucker for a good story. You should play those Telltale games. You press like three buttons and they just tell you a story. No, because that's not engaging at all. I have, <laughs> I have some, I have some kind of borders here. 
I don't like just sitting there and pointing and clicking things. I like to move and do things. Well, now you're just contradicting. No. Well, here's another unpopular opinion. Is a freaking point-and-click game an actual video game? Wow. That's not Uh, one that I wrote down, but that's one that I've seen. I've never thought about that. Because you're not... I mean, you're playing... Quotes, well, when you playing. get into the nitty gritty and you define what a game is, there is like what an end goal, and there is some type of opposition or something like. There's got to be some conflict or something. So, you know, let's say the pointing. You know, I don't have any experience to argue with this, but <laughs> there's point and click games where you have to find stuff, right? And you have to unlock things and get to the end. That's a thing, right? You were asking the wrong person, dude. I have no (laughs) idea. I've never played one. Well, how about this? Let's ask the audience. Do y'all think a uh, point-and-click game is a game at all? I'm curious to hear the responses. That is an interesting one. Okay. Um, So my next one, while I've already pissed off the uh, Thousand Year Door fans, I'm also going (laughs) to piss off the Mario Sunshine and Galaxy fanboys. Those are not the same fanboys. You're already making me mad. No, that's what I'm saying. I've I've already pissed off that Mario group, and now I'm going to piss off another one. <laughs> so I'm going to piss off all the Mario people. Um, I didn't like those games. I thought that... I, I don't know. I just... I could not get through them. And I couldn't tell you why for Galaxy, besides the fact that, you know, traveling along those planets made me sick. Because I get motion sick really easy, so I literally could not finish it. Well, that's um, fair. And I know I said lin- linearity isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I didn't like it in my Mario games. I'm used to being able to do whatever I want in a Mario game, like Super Mario 64. How, what? No, no, no. That is about as linear as Galaxy. Those two are, like, equally linear. Are you kidding me? No, I don't think so, man. I remember having to follow, like, a strict thing. Like, I had to go to this planet, shoot through the stupid star thing, and go to another planet. I don't it's remember the same way that you go to a different painting whenever you've gotten enough stars on the first painting. Nah, man, because that's like an what is it called? An overworld where you where you go from that point to another place and you go back. I didn't feel that way in Galaxy. You, you know what I'm saying? Just like just described the hub world in Galaxy. You need to like go back and play it before like <laughs> before you say what you're saying. I don't know, man. I just I could not get through it. And then Sunshine is the same thing. So in Super Mario 64, you could do whatever mission or collect whatever star you wanted to in whatever order you just had to there was certain places you had to unlock but it didn't make you complete certain missions you just had to have a certain amount of stars to defeat bowser again right uh and sunshine isn't like this you have to complete i think it's seven out of the eight sprites in every world to get the story to go is that true yeah, I because I looked it up because I I remember telling you like I thought the game glitched out like I thought I was stuck, <laughs> but no, you have to get seven out of the eight sprites in that world, meaning you have to collect most of the sprites in order to complete the game in order to move the story along with um, Bowser Jr. or Shadow Mario. Spoiler alert, sorry. <laughs> I'm not gonna argue with you on that game. That game makes me mad, and I don't know why or what <laughs> is wrong with it, but something is wrong with Mario Sunshine. <laughs> I Multiple don't like occasions, it. I have tried to beat that game and I can't do it. Not because I suck, but because the game just pisses me off, man. I agree. I don't like it. I've never liked it. I've never completed it. But yeah, after after researching this for this podcast, I realized that that's what you have to do. I'm like, that freaking sucks. Because some of those levels on there are, like, awful. Like, the ones where you don't have, um, what the heck, the water thing, Flood. And it's like the platform, like, I, ugh. Oh, it's just, yeah. some of those levels are so hard. And, like, I don't want to complete them. And in Mario 64, you didn't have to. You know what I'm saying? I do, yeah. You could just pick whatever one you wanted. As long as you had a certain amount. Galaxy, though? Come on, dude. Okay. To be fair, I only put a few hours in, and that was, like, six years ago. But... I remember not liking it. So I remember what I was feeling, not necessarily what the gameplay was. You know what I'm saying? I can excuse the motion sickness if that's really like a thing that you struggle with, but I can't excuse not liking the game. It's just a great game. 
I, well, I'm going to piss off some more people here, but I don't like 3D World either. <laughs> oh, I'm going to hang up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I just, I, there's something about Super Mario 64 and no Mario game after that has replicated that feeling for me. And not just nostalgia, but being able to do whatever I wanted to do when I wanted to do it. Like the closest is um, Mario Odyssey, but even then it doesn't have, um, what did you say, a HUD world or whatever it's called? Right. Yeah, that one really doesn't. So, I mean, it's still a fantastic game, but it doesn't quite capture that feeling that Super Mario 64 gave me. Well, uh, if you're going to bring up 3D World, first of all, you're wrong. 10 out of 10 games. Oh, I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, people argue that that game is a 3D Mario game, and it's it's just a fact that it's not like a 2d mario game consists of you turning on like going into the level and getting to the flag at the end like that is the definition of a 2d mario game and that's what you do in 3d world like i get it it has 3d in the title but 3d land and 3d world those are 2d mario games so i don't think they should ever be compared with odyssey sunshine galaxy mario 64 like they're they're not the same and I've had people argue with me on Twitter about it, and I just have to give up because I'm not a big arguer, but it's my freaking podcast, so I can argue now. Oh, snap. Okay, no, I agree <laughs> with that. I definitely agree with that. Okay, cool. Because, again, it's one of those games that I played, and it wasn't it just it just wasn't magical like Nint- or, um, Super Mario 64 was, but I think that's probably because I'm comparing it to the other ones. If it's like a genre of its own, like quasi 3D, 2D-ish or whatever... Then I'd be like, okay, fine. But when it's compared to the other ones, I say, no, bad, wrong. You know? There's agreeing on something. Yeah. (laughs) Well, why don't you do a couple more? Okay, so um, this might contradict everything that I just said. But to be fair, I didn't say that those are bad games. I just thought that they weren't the games for me. Right? Okay, so my next one is just because you don't like a game doesn't mean it's a bad game. Right, so I asked, this is one of those questions that I asked on Instagram, and most people were pretty level-headed about it. They're like, yeah, just because I don't like it doesn't mean it's a bad game, but there was like a good 25%, which was probably like 200 people said that if I don't like it, it's a bad game, and I think that's kind of a scary mindset to have, you know? Yeah, that's that's childish, honestly. (laughs) Like... I don't like Animal Crossing. I've said that over and over and over and over again. I think it's boring and it's borderline pointless. But I realize that it's just the genre that I don't like and not the game. You know, on the topic of point and click stuff, it's like, uh, is Animal Crossing really a game? <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, uh, keep going. <laughs> um, so yeah, and it's and it's one of Nintendo's best-selling IPs. So clearly somebody likes it. Somebody thinks it's a good game. But... That's not always the case. Obviously, if it's a bad game, it's just a bad game. But you can have fun with it, with a bad game. Just because someone says that a game is bad doesn't mean you can't have fun playing it. Like, sometimes the most hilariously bad games are the most fun to play, like, with friends. Because you're like, oh, my God, this is this is so bad. It's hilarious, you know? Right. Yeah, definitely. Yep, no argument here. Okay, this one is probably really controversial, and I don't really have a lot of facts to back this up. It's more of just a feeling, but I'm not sure you can call yourself a gamer if you only play multiplayer games. Like, you're limiting yourself so much (laughs) just to those one games that you're, like, barely a gamer, in my opinion. Same thing with mobile gamers. Are you really a gamer if you're playing mobile games? (laughs) Well, good news is I don't think a single mobile gamer is going to be listening to this podcast, but, uh, (laughs) that's so weird to me that there's such a thing as a mobile gamer. There's no, like, right or wrong here, but I would say you're definitely not a gamer if you play exclusively on phones and stuff. But I don't know. That's just, like, me being me. Just an opinion, right? Um, But as far as multiplayer games go, people could say that... Okay, you literally only play on Switch, so if you want to talk about limiting things, you're limiting yourself from not playing on other platforms with... Sony's got a, a million exclusives. You know, I'm not going to talk about Xbox because they have two, but you're <laughs> limiting yourself from, a, like, a bunch of games that are only on other consoles. I think I'm limiting myself 
less than you think because I grew up with a PlayStation 2. So I also have all of those other games. And I don't just play Nintendo published games. Like, I can't even tell you how many other freaking Switch games I have that have nothing to do with Nintendo besides Mm -hmm. the fact that they're on the console. And a lot of them are cross-platform, too. Yeah. The ones that aren't Nintendo. So, yeah, I agree that I probably don't get as many experiences as everyone else does, especially with games like first-person shooters or stuff like that, because I really only have Fortnite and play Fortnite, or Splatoon 2, I guess. But, yeah, I don't know. I It's just, you're they're limiting themselves to only multiplayer games, so they only know... Unless they just want to call themselves, you know, multiplayer gamers, that's fine. Oh, so you're gonna you're gonna lay down the law for what the definition of gamer is? I think that <laughs> there should be a line drawn somewhere. Where that line is, I don't know, but All there right, should definitely be a line somewhere. If you don't play any one player game, you don't make the cut. Everybody else. Yeah, exactly. You're in. Get off the gamer bandwagon. Dang. You heard it here. Go send your angry messages to <laughs> at GameGirlAdvanceSP on Instagram. No, yeah, I doubt fight any, me. Uh, I doubt any, you know, exclusively Call of Duty and Fortnite players are listening to this podcast, but who knows? Yeah, they're probably not. Uh, I guess I'll take a turn here. Uh, the N64 isn't that great. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> I, know that's what, I know that's what you're waiting for. That's all I have to say. No, I I mean, we did the episode, we did the the video when you came to Texas about um, all of the exclusive N64 games, right? And when it came out, it wasn't a revolutionary console. They were still doing cartridges. Everybody knows the story. Um, Everyone else moved on to discs at that point. The N64's graphics were lagging behind. The controller's freaking weird. I don't think there are enough exclusives on the platform to make it worth picking up in 2020. I just, I'm not a big fan of the N64. So that's my unpopular opinion. And that's coming from a kid who was born in 96. So take that as you will. Ouch. I have a whole list of things to argue (laughs) with you. (laughs) Okay. So you say that there's not enough exclusives yet. We put out an exclusive video that took us a half an hour to do. <laughs> a half okay. an hour video <laughs> of exclusives. 20 of those minutes were sports titles. Tell me I'm wrong. No, you're not wrong, but there's still a lot of other stuff on there. Obviously, if you're looking at it right now and you were just introduced to gaming five minutes ago, obviously most people are going to say that the PS4 or the Xbox One or the games on there, are the freaking best. But as someone of someone who didn't grow up with those first, I realize how freaking revolutionary the Nintendo 64 was. You know, it was it was one of the first consoles to have 3D games, and it's, it's some of the best games of all time <laughs> were, on, were on that platform. Super Mario 64, GoldenEye, and Legend of Zelda, just to name a few. But I know there's a whole bunch more. So, I know we've talked about this before, but there were so many unique attachments that the Nintendo 64 had. So, first of all, we talked about the N64 DD, which connects to the frickin' internet. The internet! Can you imagine (laughs) that? The internet in 1996, or whenever it came out. Did it really connect to the internet? Yes! It connected to the internet. Uh, and then Rumble Packs, which made the whole, uh, controller shake. That was pretty freaking cool. Uh, not to mention the D-pad on there. And the analog stick. <laughs> and, and the voice recognition for Hey You Pikachu. Right? And it had a mouse where you could play Mario Paint and The Sims. And it had a freaking camera. Now, a lot of these I know didn't come out in the U.S., but they still had it. How freaking cool is that? The internet, dude. <laughs> and and also cartridges. How could you not like cartridges? You didn't... And, I mean, I, there are some exceptions. But most games didn't need memory cards, right? It was just whatever was on the console. So you didn't have to freaking plug it in and load it up. There was no load screens. Uh, first console to have four-player multiplayer. Uh, Z-targeting and the Z-button, which is where you click the button and it automatically targets to an enemy. And the console is durable as hell, dude. You know how many times I've <laughs> dropped that freaking thing? Why are you dropping it? 
Uh, because I was a three-year-old child. That's why. But yeah, that's, it's, I mean, it's the greatest console to ever live. My instinct is to say that the uh, Dreamcast had 90% of the things you just listed, including internet, but it didn't come out for another three years here in America, so I suppose the N64 was the first to do a lot of those things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it was. <laughs> but it ain't that great in 2020. No, and I could see that. Like I said, if someone were to come into gaming, obviously they wouldn't think that that's the best one. But for the time, and even for a few years after that, it was freaking amazing. I'm definitely glad I grew up with that. Um, Nintendo definitely made me into the type of person or <laughs> type of gamer that I am today. The type of uh, person that I am today. Well, you know, <laughs> Nintendo is probably the reason I got this YouTube channel and everything. So we can mm-hmm. leave that in there. What else you got for us? All right. Well, now that you're wrong. Uh, so my <laughs> next one, <laughs> my next one would be that games nowadays all look the same on other consoles. Obviously not on Nintendo consoles, but so... <laughs> The point of where games are going, right, is to look as lifelike as possible, right? Yeah. So that's where all the consoles are going. Like, oh, you know, we have facial expressions now and and we use live action characters and we, you know, we capture all this stuff. But if all the games are going there, then all the games are eventually going to look the same because there's only one real world that only looks like one thing. You know what I'm saying? So I... And I, and I think that's already happening now. Like, when I watched last year's E3, I watched everyone's presentation, right? I watched PlayStation, and I watched Xbox. And seriously, 95% of the games, I thought I was watching the same freaking game. So like, God, this, this game's got a really long trailer. But no, they're all separate games, but they all looked the same to me, you know? And I'm, I'm sure if, if you're a big fan of that, you know, those exclusive games on the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox, and you might know, you could probably pick it out faster than I could. But coming from someone who doesn't necessarily play a lot of those games, they all look the freaking same. I've never noticed that. I don't know if I could argue with it, but uh, I guess that's one advantage to, you know, animated graphics instead of making them look as realistic as possible. Yeah, so I think, and this, I mean, this can apply to all AAA games, but I think Nintendo still manages to make AAA games look realistic, but not too lifelike. And I think this is another one of your points, but I'm not really keen on graphics. You know, I don't have to play the best looking game in order to enjoy it. I'm not a 60 frames rate per second type of guy. Like, it's not at the top of the list for me. Yeah, I absolutely agree. That is one of my points. I don't know if you want me to talk about that now or later, but um, actually I can talk about that now. So one of my other unpopular opinions is gameplay over graphics. So obviously coming from a background where we played a lot of you know, what they're considered now retro games on Nintendo 64 and the GameCube and stuff, they don't look great now. Some of them did not hold up to the test of time. But they're still regarded as some of the best video games ever created. Right, yeah. And the example that I have here is Death Stranding, which take this, you know, opinion with a grain of salt because I didn't play it, but I watched people play it, and it just seems like a walking simulator. Like, yeah, the stuff looks cool, but there was hardly anything to do. Like, what was the gameplay besides walking around? Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> I also didn't play it, but I, you know, with all the hype around it, I was like, man, this game's gonna be amazing, huh? And I watched, like, some gameplay, and I'm like, what the heck is this? It was so, a snooze fest. Yeah. Um. So, my next one is big online games are ruining gaming. And so, let me clarify there. So, companies are making too many first-person shooters, or whatever is trendy, Right, because I know it's going to make money and they can add uh, microtransactions and whatever else. And then so companies start to only focus on multiplayer games like EA, right? So less single player games are being made because they don't necessarily make as much money because they don't have microtransactions or whatever. And so if they do make single player games, they're given a lower budget. And so it's a less of investment. And so when they don't sell as well as the multiplayer games, they're like, oh, well, see, nobody wants to play multiplayer games anymore. That is very true. So I think companies are investing way too much in multiplayer games, but they keep selling. So they're like, well, why not? So I hope, I hope, you know, there does not come a time when only multiplayer games are out there. Well, as long as Nintendo's a company, I don't think that's going to be a concern. But um, yeah, yeah, I mean, like just the other day, Ubisoft had their Ubisoft Forward event and they just announced a new um, 
what's it called? A new battle royale. So they just these battle royales don't stop coming out. These Call of Duties and everything like Call of Duty don't stop coming out. I see what you mean. Uh, and this one is not a shot at any developers at all because I realize making a game is difficult. But I'm kind of tired of seeing the 8-bit or like pixelized indie games. Hmm. I think that that I mean so many games are coming out that are pixelized and some of them look beautiful. I'm not I'm not going to say that they don't. But mm-hmm. I like seeing games that have really unique and different art styles. That is another thing I can't really argue with. I mean, I'm not sick of it, but it it does seem like every indie game is <laughs> an 8 or 16-bit art style. That's that's an interesting point, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I understand that indie developers obviously don't have a, a super big budget or whatever, but I don't know. I like to see different, like an art style. Like if I see a pixel, like a pixelated game or 16 or 18 bit, I'm like, okay, that looks cool. But how much better could that game be if it had its own unique art style? Like how much more would it stand out? And you know, you know? that's kind of funny coming right off of this graphics topic that we were just talking about because everyone's trying to make the best graphics in the world and they used to, you're saying they look the same and now uh, we're talking about retro old old school graphics and how they all look the same so that is interesting to think about as well mm-hmm. somewhere in the middle please <laughs> yeah i agree there's nothing wrong with being different shovel knight was like the at least for me is like the first big game that came out with that like art style i don't know that's like the one in my head that stands out the most obviously the the real first game that did 8-bit style i don't even know what i'm trying to say right now but <laughs> that's the one yeah. that stands out in my head and ever since shovel knight was a huge success for yacht club games it's just been repetitive 8 and 16-bit graphics the messenger came out celeste yep. came out um just so many not to say that they aren't good games but absolutely not yeah these are uh i put these in two bullet points but we're just gonna say um one bullet point because they are the same series i'm a big fan of Star Fox adventures and originally i don't think a lot of people were a big fan of this one but now i'm not sure that saying Star Fox adventures is good is an unpopular opinion i feel like it used to be a really unpopular opinion but i've always been a fan of this game i got it but way before um i got it when i was young you know the gamecube was alive and um just it's not a nostalgic thing for me it's just a decent zelda game you know i'm not going to tell you that this is a fantastic game and it's certainly not a star fox game but it's a solid game and you know if you're a fan of 3d action adventure zelda style games you know this game is not too hard it's linear praise the lord (laughs) it's a it's a pretty good game and then star fox zero everybody hates that game i was a big fan of it it's uh not a big fan of it. it i was i enjoyed the game just like Star Fox Adventures, it was good. You know, the Wii U gamepad was used, if I remember correctly, it was heavily used, and the motion didn't bother me. It was, I don't know, it wasn't the end of the world. I think giving people the option to not use motion would be nice, but overall, it was a pretty good game. Did you play either one? I did not play either one, even though I do <clears throat> own Star Fox Zero, but it goes back to that tradition thing it's not a traditional star fox game so people don't like it but it doesn't mean it's a bad game i think zero is absolutely unless you're talking about adventures i am talking about adventures okay. sorry yeah yeah i totally see what you mean they came out with star fox assault the next installment and it was sort of back to the uh the formula i don't know that one was way more well received it kind of had like on the ground gameplay as well as flight combat gameplay so I also like that one, but Adventures is a solid game. I don't I don't like seeing hate about it. That's definitely one that I want to try, though. If I ever do stumble upon it in the wild and I buy it, that is definitely one that I want to try. Because I like Zelda games, so why not? Why not? And it's one of Rareware's last uh, Nintendo installments. Oh, I did not know that. Really? No, I didn't. One of their last games before Xbox bought them. Well, you learn something new every day, don't you? <laughs> Okay, so my next one is video games are made too easy now. Um, oh my gosh, so, yes. So I can only really relate to these, the ones that I've played, but I think Nintendo, it hurts me to say this, but I think Nintendo might make their games, some of their games, too easy. I think some of them are appropriately leveled, but 
one that I constantly think of is Kirby Star Allies. That one was just like a breeze. Like you could play that game in like three hours. I don't spend sixty dollars on a lot of games, but that game made me regret it. That was way too easy. Yeah, it was too easy and it was too short. But you know, back in the day, they made games much harder. Sometimes maybe even impossible. I'm sure you've played some of the games. That some of those games. But it was so that the consumer had to keep playing over and over and over and over and over again. So they thought they were getting a better deal because they put some more, like, so much hours into it. So many mm-hmm. more hours than just breezing right through it. Yeah, and a lot of those games were uh, arcade ports, right? So they were trying to get your quarters, you know. Right. They were they were arcade games ported to console, which, you know, you probably had some continues and some lives, but they were still hard as nails. And not even looking into, like, 1985 with the NES, you look at a game like the first Rayman, that game is extremely difficult. And it's not to say that we don't have difficult games today. From what I understand, Dark Souls is a ridiculously difficult game. Right. But I know what you mean. Freaking Mario Odyssey, dude, you never had to worry about a game over in that game. I don't even know what if there is a game over because you have these coins that... You lose, what, 10 when you die? And you have thousands. Yeah, thousands upon thousands (laughs) upon thousands. Yeah, so that, so like I said, games, and and I think that maybe now companies make them easier so that you finish them and then you move on to the next game. Like spend $60 plus whatever microtransactions freaking EA throws in there. But $60 and then when you're finished in like 15 hours, because you didn't have to die or anything, you just, you know, you kept playing. Then you go on to spend the next sixty dollars, you know. Yeah. Honestly, Kirby is not a good example because every Kirby game just about has been really easy. So, I guess you could argue that we we should have known what we were signing up for. But I don't know. If if you're gonna make it that easy, make it longer. Right. And so this one's a hot take. Maybe this is probably a more hard to swallow pill than an unpopular opinion. But a game is not bad if you just suck at it. Like. There are so many people that I think play Fortnite or other first-person shooters and they're like, this game sucks after playing it for a few hours because they don't take the time, you know, to actually get good at it. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's so many times where I picked up a game and I was like, this game freaking sucks, which is because I suck at it. (laughs) Yeah. I think people are too, I don't know, prideful or scared to admit that they just, they suck at a game. But I think that kind of makes it more fun like especially if you're playing with other people like oh my god i suck at this game (laughs) this person's gonna suck too let's try to make them play it you know right yeah i don't think that's an unpopular opinion i think it's uh definitely something worth mentioning though because if you're listening to this and you think that a game sucks because you're trash at it just uh give it some more practice you know a lot of times even if you're not a collector and you might have xbox game pass or you might be playing on pc and you just have hundreds of games to play so it's really easy to be like you know what i'm trash at this so i'm gonna like put this down and put and play another game you know it's that happens to me probably a lot um well, I, don't, I don't know about that i can't think of an example but it's really easy to like not get far in a game or suck at it and then just pick something else up because we have so many other options you know as yeah, a kid that's true. you're like you don't have any any funds to buy new games so even if the game sucks you're gonna keep trying it and trying to get better at it it's a discipline thing i guess yeah definitely and the more obviously the more time you put it in the better you get you're like oh maybe this isn't such a bad game after all um and then we talked about this one a little bit well actually we kind of already talked about this one but it's a good story and a game can carry the whole game for me we already talked about that with fire emblem but right i think so and then we talked about gameplay over graphics um okay and this one's a hot take is Nintendo is the only company to me that feels like they innovate and it feels like Sony and Microsoft are just selling watered down PCs. Yeah, I saw that on your list and it's it's fair. It's uh people are talking about the Series X and the PS5 and that's like pretty much what they are internally, you know? Yeah, so it's just I don't know, for me, and obviously I'm a Nintendo fangirl, so obviously I'm going to say that they're better than everyone else, but they Everyone knows that Nintendo's graphics are not on par with Xbox and um, PlayStation 4. Everyone knows that. Nintendo's always really been behind, but they innovate, so it makes it worth it. Somebody could argue that it's just gimmicky stuff, but I don't I don't think it's gimmicky. I think it's a nice twist on the 
Yeah, ever since the 360 versus the PS3, it's just been the same thing for both of those consoles. Like, this is going to lead directly into my next topic, but um, it's like they... Yeah, I, I totally agree. The, the Wii was a big deal because you could literally bowl in your living room. Then PS3 with the, the camera, the PS Move or whatever, and Xbox 360 tried to copy with Kinect, and it just didn't work out. But Nintendo does a great job of it. I think they... They get a bad rap for some of the things, but it seems like with the Switch, they've kind of um, they've kind of been able to appeal to both the hardcore gamer and the the gamer that's looking for those gimmicky things, or I guess that's the word I'm trying to avoid. But the the motion controls and the difference, the uh, the innovation. Yeah, I agree. I think Nintendo, especially this generation, is doing a really good job of incorporating both of those uh, audiences. But to to me, when I look at Sony. And, and Microsoft and the PS4 and the, and the Xbox, I just see the same console, but with different exclusives. Yeah, I've been saying the same thing for years, which, do you have more you want to talk about? Because this is perfect timing. Nope, you're up. Console wars are stupid. Just play what you want to play, and and don't get on Twitter and tell me that my Xbox One is stupid and that I shouldn't be excited for the Xbox Series X. Like, I don't know. The freaking, the Sega Nintendo console war, that was like a really cool thing in the 90s. Um, you know, they had their slogans and they were like, Sega does what Nintendo don't and all the famous stuff that we know. Honestly, Sega, and, I mean, um, Xbox and PlayStation, they're not really fighting publicly. It's just the consumers that are fighting, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't even have a reason for loving Xbox the way I do. I was talking to my friend about this the other day. Like, I'm a big fan of Xbox for absolutely no reason. Like, I like Halo, but I'm not buying my Xbox so that I can play that one exclusive that they have. And for some reason, I just can't get into PlayStation, even though I have a PS4. But if there's an exclusive on one, then I will buy it for the other. I will buy it for that reason. I don't have any notes for this. I'm just kind of going off the top of my head. But, like, I don't understand why you would bash on someone for playing on another console. And I feel like Nintendo is, like, almost exclus- or excluded from this topic because it's, like, they're on their own path right now, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, the Wii U came out in 2012, and I want to say the Xbox One and PS5 ca- or PS4 came out um, the following year. But halfway through that life cycle, the Switch came out in 2017, and they're not really concerned about the graphics. They're not concerned about having the most powerful console, and I like that a lot. I like that people are, you know, I feel like it used to be Nintendo versus Xbox versus PlayStation, but now it's like, yeah, you can have a Nintendo Switch and either one of the other two. You know, I feel like it's more accepted in air quotes part of me was like that's not even an unpopular opinion and I was like you know it really is because people like to argue for just no reason about whether the Xbox is better than the PlayStation and they're the same thing it's just the exclusives that's really all it is yeah I definitely agree I think Nintendo's on their own path and I like that they're not competing with the other ones I mean they might be competing for your dollars are you gonna pick up are you gonna pick up Origami King or you know Ghost of Tsushima but um shishimi <laughs> um, uh but yeah but not on necessarily console sales they're just hitting a different market they might overlap but i think i think they're appealing to different audiences okay um i know we kind of talked about this earlier but i think the wii u was a great system i think I think it was innovative, and they did something with the gamepad that no other gaming company did or would do. Um, And then before all those, you know, games were ported to the Switch, it had some really amazing games. Some really unique ones. I literally loved that console so much. It was so... It was so good. (laughs) And I liked the gamepad. Some people said it was, like, too bulky to hold, but I liked it. I thought it was comfortable. Like, I could comfortably rest my arms in my lap. You know, it didn't seem too big. Yeah, I never got that argument either. And to tell you the truth, I would go as far as to say that this isn't even an unpopular opinion as of late because everybody, it seems like, is like, oh, yeah, I've always been a big fan of the Wii U. Like, where were y'all when the Switch was coming out? Y'all were always like talking about how garbage the Wii U was. And it just makes me mad. I think a lot of people 
have like switched onto the hype train or whatever. I don't know, but go ahead. Um, and this is probably just a personal thing for me, but I didn't have a TV that connected to the internet. I didn't have a smart TV. I don't think a lot of people did, but the Wii U was like my do everything like little system because it connect it could connect to the internet on just a browser and you can open up whatever you want. It had YouTube and Amazon and um Hulu and all those other things. Like oh, I thought yeah. and not to mention the virtual console. I mean that's that's probably one of one of the main reasons why people still have a Wii U, but I just thought it was awesome and I literally used it every day. Whether for playing games or going on the internet. And watching streaming stuff. Yeah, I didn't have a smart TV either. And before I had my Xbox One, I watched the heck out of Netflix or whatever, YouTube on it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, and then this can be said about a lot of things, a lot of media. But I think that dubbed games are awful. Like, if they're dubbed into English and they originally came out in, like, Japan for Japanese audi- audiences, there's, like, a cultural disconnect. I mean, I say the same thing about my anime, but dub they're just awful. There's something that Japanese you know, voice actors can do that Americans cannot. Like, English speakers just cannot. I don't know if you ever had this problem. You don't play a lot of JRPGs, but they're just bad. Or I, I don't know if they just don't invest, the, the or the, you know, the um, localizers just don't invest a lot of time into the voice actors. But they're just, they're not good. I don't have a lot of experience. Um, I've only just begun watching anime you know i've probably completed five or six animes in the last few years and you know it's totally different for you you have um like i don't know you you study the language and the culture and it's it's totally a different experience for you you know yeah but i i thought that even before i started studying japanese i just there's just something that that does not connect there it doesn't bother me. I've the only game experience I could think of is Trials of Mana from April, and like it didn't bother me. But I got on Twitter and I would see people like roasting some of the, <laughs> some of the English voice actors. But at least that game had the option to put the uh, original language in there. Yeah, they if if they are like that, they should definitely have the Japanese voice actors option. I will go with that a hundred percent of the time. All right, last one for me. Uh, backwards compatibility is really not that important to me. Um, this is going mostly towards Xbox and PlayStation here. Like we talked about, the PS5 is not going to have, in the news earlier, we're not going to have, um, you're not going to be able to pl- put your PS1 disc in there. It's really not the end of the world for me. I mean, I'm a collector, so obviously I, I my, my argument might be a little invalid for some people that just have the newest generation of consoles but if you really want to play the old console you might just want to go buy one on ebay or something (laughs) um obviously the nintendo switch has abandoned it and i think it's cool that the wii u could play wii games i think it's cool that the wii could play gamecube games but i would have bought those consoles regardless and I would have paid the same amount of money if I couldn't play the previous console. I don't know. It's just not that big of a deal to me. It seems like the end of the world for a lot of people. What do you think? I kind of agree and kind of disagree. I don't think that it's such a big deal anymore. uh, Because I think, you know, gamers that are coming in don't really necessarily care about the old retro games. I think that's just a cultural thing. Um, But for me personally, I played a lot of the obviously the older Nintendo games or handheld games. Um, and I liked like Game Boy games and Game Boy Color games. I liked to be able to play those on my Game Boy SP with a lit screen. I know that's kind of irrelevant now, but I still like being able to do that. And I think that Nintendo should continue that whatever their next console is like i don't know if it's going to be like a switch 2 or whatever so i I mean imagine they'll have backwards compatibility with the original switch but i think it's important for me but specifically just for nintendo things i don't have a lot of experience with xbox or playstation 4 okay i have i have three more so another one of mine is i know how i said like a lot of games look very similar but I'm kind of tired of seeing zombies in games. Like, there are so many where there's just zombies or walkers or whatever else. Whatever they're called. Walkers. Whatever they're called. It's not like they're everywhere. 
I think that's one of those things where I'm tired of seeing it in movies too, but there's just so many games with, a, you know, a brain eating or flesh eating or whatever walking thing that, you know, is some version of a zombie. That might just be something stupid. Not that I'd ever play those games because I'm a baby and I don't play like Resident Evil, but there's a lot of freaking games with zombies in it. Um... And then we, we talked about this briefly earlier, but I think digital is ruining collecting and gaming in general for me. I'm ready um, for that episode because we have a lot to talk about. Yeah, so I'll, I guess I'll leave that for that. But uh, my last one is Nintendo has the best exclusives. <laughs> Don't you think? I mean, you're, you're 100% right about that. Uh, but it just depends what type of gamer you are because that's a hundred percent an opinion thing. If you like The Last of Us Two, then you're not gonna get a Switch. I mean, plain and simple. If you like Mario and Zelda, you're gonna get a Switch. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and not to say that the other consoles don't have great exclusives, but I mean, out like I I actually looked this up because I was curious. Um. So titles including. Zelda Breath of the Wild, Super Mario Bros, Pokemon, Mario Kart, Super Mario World, Super Mario Bros, Ultimate, Nintendogs, Wii Sports, Slash, Wii Sport Resort, and are some of the best-selling video games of all time. Um, and on the Wikipedia page, which I know is not the best source for any information, but it seemed pretty accurate, out of the 50 best-selling games of all time, Nintendo v- developed 19 of them and published 25 of them. Well, that's half. And this is even... This is even more impressive because, obviously, those games aren't multi-platform. So, some of the other games on that list include, like, from Xbox or or Sony or Namco or whatever else, were multi-platform. But they still sold that many copies being exclusive to the Switch, or to to Nintendo consoles. Yeah, those are some interesting numbers there. I mean, if you want to make your opinion a fact, you're doing a great job. (laughs) This is (laughs) is one of those ones where it's a darn fact. I brought up some facts here (laughs) instead of feelings. Uh, but yeah, and I will stick by that opinion. Cool. Uh, forever. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that, that pretty much does it for me. It's all my unpopular opinions. Feel free to fight me down in the comments. Yeah, we got plenty for you guys to fight about, but this has been a pretty long episode coming up on two hours almost. Oh so, we're going to wrap it up here. Um, but like I said at the beginning, we want to hear from you guys. Tell us some of your unpopular opinions or tell us why we're wrong and start a fight in the comments. <laughs> yeah. But until fight next me. time, where can the people find you, Hannah? You can find me at Gang Relevance SP on Instagram. In case you didn't hear that the other four times I said it this podcast, but uh <laughs> I am at that gamer nerd on Instagram and at Bird Dog Gaming everywhere else. We'll see you guys next time for episode eight of the Unlockable Podcast. See ya. Thank you.